So there are three things which we must remember. The radiation dose is directly proportional to the total spine time. It's total time that is spent in the radiation area. That much dose you are getting. So if you are spending hours and hours working in a place where you know it has got high radiation, then you are getting high radiation. You'll never know it is striking your body, it's there. So whenever we walk into experimental areas in, uh, in accelerators, there before you enter, they monitor the entire place. There are continuous monitors placed everywhere. Even if by mistake, the radiation level goes higher than what a body can take, the alarms will beep and immediately all doors will shut automatically. It's all controlled uh, through automation, right? So, second thing is allowable working time is equal to dose equivalent limit by dose. We will go a little bit detail in the next PPTs about this. How much can you work there? So, when you go to accelerators, you will, if you ask your students, they will say, if they are interested in physics, where do you want to do? Astrophysics. Then where do you want to go? Go CERN. Or where do you want to go? TFR. It is also then necessary for you to impart this knowledge to the students that there you are going to work with radiation. So all the more reason that you should take the SEC paper of radiation safety so that you are aware of what kind of work you are going to do and what all you will be facing. So this allowable work with time is how much you are allowed is monitored by your personal pocket dosimeter personal pocket dosimeter and here the material scientists can become very happy because it is because of their research on sensors and various devices that these dosimeters and pocket radiation monitors have been developed right so this particular field of radiation is a fusion of so many types of sciences that there is nobody who can say that oh this is something that I am not connected with and my research is not connected with. For example in inter-university accelerator center or in any other accelerator center there are equal number of material scientists, equal number of people who are dealing with electronics, with computers, with nuclear physics, atomic physics and accelerator mass spectrometry and so on. So accelerator or accelerator related uh, physics involves every kind of physicist. This is what I mean to say. So how much distance you should keep? The exposure rate is at a distance d1, exposure rate at distance d2. You will always find that the distance, if you keep maintain a distance from a source, obviously you are going to absorb less. This is pure common sense. You go closer to the source, you get absorbing more of radiation, you go farther away. So this very simple sentence makes us understand that if we are dealing with radiation sources, then we, we are near them only when it is required. Okay, we are, you are doing an experiment with alpha particles, you get an alpha source, you place it, fine, and then you move away. You don't keep standing next to it, you know, and chatting away to glory. Right? So, these kind of things we come to know that there is time is important, how much time you are spending in radiation, how much distance you are from the source, and what is shielding. Is this shielding or not? Obviously, each one of us knows the penetration power of alpha, beta, gamma rays, and a neutron through paper, plastic, lead, and concrete, and we all know that in all accelerator places, we have very heavy shielding of lead. So it's calculated. For example, the SRIM that you are going to use today, you can calculate through it how much lead shielding is required for any source of any strength. You can actually find it out yourself, right? How much lead should I take? Should it be one millimeter or should it be one centimeter or should it be one meter and so on. Who amongst you has never visited any accelerator center? Can you please tell me by raising your hand? You have never visited any accelerator center from inside. Inside, not the building outside. Inside, the accelerator place. No, outside doesn't make any sense. Accelerator inside. So, you still have, when you all are young people, you should grab the first opportunity to see an accelerator from inside. And why not you have one within your city? So, you should, it should be on top priority of yours to visit the center. Otherwise, listening to things like that, just like that, or looking movies is not the, is not fun. You see with your own eyes and that's a separate. If you want, I can help you, uh, tell you how you can go to IUAC for instance. I cannot take you to TFR, but I can take you to IUAC. Right? So, we know the penetrating power and with, or with that penetrating power, we can decide the shielding. That's all we have to understand and that's all we need to make our students understand. This is the IUAC penetron from inside and all the radiation protection uh, is inbuilt. There is detailed area monitoring, there is personal monitoring, every hall is well sheeted and it is properly interlocked so that none of the lab workers have any exposure. Right? So this 
myth or this idea that I don't want to work with accelerator or with radiation because it is hazardous, something will happen to me is absolute wrong. If there is no problem, you have center, you have people who have healthily joined the center and have healthily retired the center, retired from the center, having a successful life for 40 years or 30 years of working as a scientist at the accelerator. So this, uh, uh, so yeah, and as I said, you monitor the area, you monitor those rates, and you have personal monitoring devices. I now go quickly because I have to, so area monitoring system, you see these are there in every hall. They are continuously monitoring how much radiation is going on in that area. And if there, if there is any leak, if there is any radiation, immediately all, all doors, all doors will stop completely. There are alarms and so on. You can see and read this PPT in more details as I share it to you on WhatsApp. So these are personal, just to have, just for you to have a understanding what are the badges looking like. So this badge, this neutron film, neutron film badges are different from radi uh, normal radiation ones. Pocket oscillator, digital pocket oscillator, just like a pen. You just put it inside and then you keep on working. Right in the morning you put it inside, keep on. And at the end of the day you just give it back to the health physicist. So a reading is there. In every dosimeter, it start, It has a reading. That reading is how much radiation you have taken. And then you walk throughout the day. In the evening, you go back and you give it. The health physicist will sit down, take the reading, do the subtraction, find out how much radiation you have been exposed to during the day. If in any case, it is more than the permissible level, you will be sent on a holiday. So, that, yeah, you are sent on a holiday, you don't work, you relax and then you are fine because your body comes back on its own. So there's a good joke, uh, there's a good incident which I would like to share which will wake up people who are sleeping right in the morning in the audience. Uh, so one person, one senior scientist who was not so careful, uh, he, he kept his uh, pocket dosimeter, dosimeter and forgot. And in that drawer there was a source. So he kept it to the source, and the source and the pocket dosimeter looked like this and he forgot. And after three, four days, he remembered, took it out from the drop and submitted it. And then there was alarm all over the center. Oh my God, he has to be sent on a holiday. And he was actually written off, you have to go on a holiday of a month. You have been exposed to harmful uh, doses of radiation and so on. And he was absolutely wrong. And now he, he just did not want to say that I made this mistake. But then everybody was concerned, oh, you should be taken to a hospital and so on and so forth. Then he said, and then he said, no, I'm sorry, I left my pocket oscillator long next to the source. So I, I'm sure uh, it so sounds something very funny, but even a senior scientist could make such a mistake. So you have to be very careful regarding pocket dosimeters. They are next to your body. Never share it with your friend. So suppose you give it to your friend, take my dosimeter, go inside, and then that person is exposed. But ultimately, you will be registered as exposed and so on. So, uh, the takeaway thing is pocket dosimeters are here to protect every radiation worker and they are closely monitored by a group of people who are in direct contact with BARC within our country and AERB people. So, there is no harm in working with radiation. That's what we understand because we are so closely monitored, right? So, now, we will talk about this in my PPT, we will talk more in detail about this. We talked about time, distance and shielding, we understood that, we understood about Alara, we understood that the permissible radiation level has to be some value and that value is 1 milli radians or 10 microcilial per hour, okay. Long term evidence should be also below permissible limit. So for example, today I had to do an experiment, then some radiation my body has taken, but if over the month I have not taken any more radiation, then that's okay because it is time. The whole average should also be within the permissible limit. Then the question that arises is how do you know what is the permissible limit? Who decides the permissible limit? So intense research has gone over all over the world and obviously India where they have set limits upon how much you can take, which dosage is allowed and which dosage is not allowed. There is a clear cut table which you just share, which you just read and it's easy to understand. And you share it also with your students. All this is already so. Permissible radiation level is 0.1 one microsievert per hour for non-radiation workers, normal public. But for radiation workers, eight hours per day, five days per week, it should be within this. Who sets it? There are two agencies. At the international level, you have international agency, International Commission of for the Nuclear Radiation. They set these values for the entire world. 
and India, AERB and BARC, they also set the limit according to the ICRP. So, our limit cannot be above ICRP. Okay, yeah, please. Where is the difference between workers and non workers? With the radiation, ultimately, we are saying human beings. The no, no, no. Case. They mean to, uh, you are not working daily in an accelerator. You are not working in BARC. If you were working as a scientist in BARC where there is radiation involved in an area, they also know BARC is not a small place like this. It's a huge place where the actual reactor is there. There the radiation is higher and it is closely monitored. There are people working going in and out also, right? So for those people, there is this limit because you cannot say that I am going into a nuclear reactor and I will not have any radiation. Obviously, there is radiation in nuclear reactor and you are working. But that radiation also should be in a limit where you can lead a successful human life without any health hazard. That is, but it will be more than normal public working in cities. And why are the limits set, set for people like us? In any case, we are not visiting um, places like. No, it's not set. It is just for your knowledge that this much you are taking in, in as it is also. You are working in a college, no radiation. This much radiation, you are still having. If by any chance, for that example, for that matter, that uh, uh, that scrap dealer who was sitting in his own shop, but he was sitting on Cobalt 60. So if, if people were so much aware, then not being a worker of uh, radiation, he still had more dose. So you should be aware that some radiation we are having all the time, but if you are going to work in some accelerator or reactor divisions, you will have higher doses, but those doses are also within limits of human health. I think rather than the radiation, it is the, the, we are exposed to this much already. Yeah, so we, let's not go by the word written yeah. by <laughs> Yeah. So as I said, this PPD is not read by me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I think this gives you a good flavor uh, about the whole thing, and it also gives you a good uh, consensus that we have to have radiation as low as possible, and uh, we should keep away from sources as much as possible, and work make nuclear power work for us in a benefit way, in a beneficial way. So. So this is the whole PPT, that's the movie which will be shared and I stop this now. Uh, was it of some use to you? I would like to have some feedback please. Do you think it was of some use to you, some information that you get? Yes. At least you know where to look for more information when you flip through the paper. That, that's what is interesting. Yes, yes. Now, so uh, yesterday we decided that we'll try to make the hands-on session a little bit longer, right? Uh, now I have to cover the rest of the portion of the theory and I hope we are attentive and we are ready to uh, grasp in a little bit of physics which we have been for the students. The first unit that we covered yesterday, we had to introduce basic ideas of radiation. I shared my experience that you can start off by giving them small assignments related to internet by which your work reduces and their knowledge enhances, right? What is the portion which I mentioned yesterday that you must focus in detail within those six hours which was the portion that I mentioned yesterday that you have to teach very properly. What did I say? Can you remember what I said? I said, it's so good because it is... Anybody remembers? Nuclear radiation. Why? Yes. This is one point I have said it in nuclear radiation that when you teach, teach about various types of radiation, we have to focus on nuclear radiation because the whole paper is about nuclear radiation and not about mobile and communication radiation. There was another place that I said that this part you have to do very properly in detail. Yeah, yeah. The Betty Block formula. The Betty Block formula and the stopping power, range and straddling, is what you have to give focus, you have to focus your attention on while teaching. So, within the first six hours that you devote to unit one, give clear cut two and a half hours to nuclear radiation and the Betty Block stopping power. Why? Because the entire range of practicals are dependent upon that. Or you can be intelligent enough. As I said, keep the practicals to yourself and in the very first class of practical, use the practical time because you are allowed to speak about the theory of the practical within the practical. So you save time there and you snatch out two hours of practicals to introduce the students to SRIM 
the, the computer simulation which we are going to do today, Bethe block formula, stopping power, range, and scattering. Am I clear or should I repeat? So you, so, you, so you gain time over 6 hours, there you then get 6 hours for all the other topics and you get 2 and a half hours within your practical time to devote on SRIM and so on which we will do in the last sessions here. So what is left now? I showed you the syllabus yesterday. Should I show it again or do you think you grasped it? It's okay? Not required? Okay. Fine. So uh, we speak about the unit number 3 which talks about Detector, detectors and monitoring devices. So we have heard a little bit about monitoring devices, the pocket dosimeters which are using various kind of sensors to measure the radiation. Apart from that, when we are talking about radiation, we need detectors which are able to detect each type of radiation. So how many types of radiations do we want to detect? How many types of radiations do we have to detect? You have to be interactive. I don't I don't give monologues. Alpha, alpha, beta, gamma, neutrons, and X-rays, photons, photons, gamma, so photons two types, either X-rays or, or gamma rays or visible lights. Are we dealing with infrared radi radiation here? We are not. Are we dealing with microwave radiation here? No. Are we dealing with visible light radiation here? No. So who says yes? Are we going to deal with visible light detection of radiation? So detection of visible light. Light is also radiation, right? So are we going to deal with detection of visible light here? Yes, no. no. Answer is wrong. We are going to deal with it. They are the one of the most important detectors, they are called scintillators and the first capturing is of light. So you see how we, we as teachers, we also have misconcepts. Let's agree to that. Okay, we all have misconcepts. Nobody is left out in this world who doesn't have misconcepts. So we have to find out how misconcepts that are inbred in us should not get propagated to the students because they are the future teachers, right? So we are going to talk about those detectors, they are in the syllabus. It's there in the syllabus, but the question is why they are in the syllabus, you all mentioned it. But please remember the visible light will also be captured in one of the detectors, right? Apart from that, apart from that, are you missing one detector? Are you missing something? Who gives radiation? Alpha, beta, gamma, X-ray, neutron, we have understood very clearly and we are all well versed with it. Is there any other kind of thing? I mentioned it yesterday. I showed some slides also on it. What is what else is the source of radiation? Small? Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays. No, we are not dealing with cosmic rays. That was only to make you energized and feel happy that instead of little shower, we are having cosmic ray shower. We are not covering cosmic rays, only introduction for the student just to make them inspired and wake up in the class right. One one most important thing. I am just speaking about it since morning. What is IUC producing? It's an accelerator, right? Ions. How can you forget ions? So, how do you make an ion? Positive ion, negative ion? You can make through accelerators, right? You are aware that you can strip it. I'm sure you all know about all basic accelerators after doing some basic courses in your masters. So, all accelerators, right? They are producing ions and ions, when they are traveling with a certain energy, they are sources of radiation, right? So, we have to have charged particle detectors also. We have to have charged particle detectors also. And what are charged particles? Positive ions or negative ions produced in any accelerator, whether it is VECC or RRCAT indoor or IUEC. Are you aware of all the accelerators that are available in India? Would you like to be aware? Okay. So, if you like to be aware, then you should know that India is right now giving accelerators to even universities. So, if our Delhi University would like to have a small accelerator, just imagine you are speaking about so much nuclear physics. Is there one single accelerator in our university where you can show to the student? And most of you, as you have yourself acknowledged, although you are living in Delhi, employed in DU, you have not visited your own accelerator within your city. Right? So, accelerator is an important uh, part of nuclear physics, but it is also an important part of physics. And we, can, we have right now several accelerators spread all over India of smaller and higher energy lengths. The biggest one is here within Delhi and at Tata Institute. 
Apart from these, we do not have uh, more in it. So both of them are going up to 15 billion volt, right? But smaller accelerators are in IOP, in Bilaspur, in Kanpur, and many other places, right? So it's a good exercise for you to find out how many accelerators we have as a teacher and if you are too lazy you give it as an assignment to the students and they will filter it all out with beautiful images and you have a wonderful ppt showing all the accelerators that are existing in india where they are using all the physics that you are teaching right so we start with radiation detectors obviously i uh, i don't have to give you great details you all are knowledgeable people just a sec yeah so slide show now this slide is also, this slide show which I am showing is also made by a student called Anjali Kanta. Happy to contact you all through her PPT. So yeah, I, this slide I don't have to repeat. We have understood that there are so many types of radiations. Charged particles is important and we have neutrons and all this we have discussed. And so now the question is that if we want to have nuclear radiation detectors, what is it that we have to cover in our syllabus? In our syllabus, in the sex syllabus of NEP, it has been clearly mentioned only the basics and working principle, nothing more. And how much time is given? Less than four hours. And that's a challenge because each of these detectors, if you remember your MSc, takes a lot of time to understand. Right. So, in this SEC paper of NEP, we have to restrict ourselves to only the basics of the detectors. Electronics people will smile, this is my heart ka khel hai, types, you know. So, very good to uh, let it be your left hand's uh, game and, you know, use it. So, different type of detectors, how many are mentioned? The gas detectors mentioned, scintillation detectors mentioned, semiconductor detectors mentioned and neutron detectors. Out of all these, the electronics people have no problem in teaching the semiconductor detector because it's basically uh, used by a semiconductor and the basic working principle that you talk about in a semiconductor is the one that is being used, right? So, is it okay if I go fast enough or do you want me to dwell a lot on it? Jaisa aap chahe. Fast, yeah, fine, okay. So here are some pictures, here are some pictures over it and in gas detectors, how much do you have to teach? Within 4 hours, all 4 detectors and there is a unit on karma and all doses. We have to unit 4 detectors. But as I said, there is some cut and paste problem which I showed yesterday, the purple shaded program. So you can easily spend 3, 3 and a half hours on detectors. And what are we going to do? We are going to use a schematic diagram of the gas fuel detector. This is a basic gas fuel detector with the central wire. There are two, uh, 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 there are two uh, electrodes, cathode and anode. And there is a gas fuel here, that's the photograph. This slide you can take. And you are just going to start your discussion with the first, do not do not try to uh, teach any detector at any time. Go by the proper uh, uh, proper uh, radiation method that the simplest one first and the simplest one is the gas detector. Introduce it with a schematic diagram. Give the basic working principle only. More than that will not be possible to teach within this hour and is not expected of them at this syllabus. Right? So schematic diagram and basic working principle. As soon as there is ionization, the pulse, the pulse, radiation pulse comes, strikes the detector and then there is an ionization, electron hole pair is created which goes towards its respective electrodes and in the end a pulse is created. What energizes the student is not just the detector but the fact that whatever pulse is produced in the detector is then captured by the computer and is shown to you without ever going near to the radiation. So, is it clear? The radiation detector is there down there in the radiation area and through your electronics you get the entire pulse within your computer system and you are able to process, right? I would also like to uh, uh, make, make it clear to you that this particular portion repeats in great detail in the core paper of NEP of nuclear physics, right? Now, you can have two attitudes. You can say that that's not my botheration because I'm not going to teach nuclear physics. Or you can say that it is because of me that those students will understand a paper later in the fifth semester of nuclear physics. Therefore, let me teach it properly so they have enough time to understand it uh, nicely and be developed as a physicist, right? So, that's one detector. You please start your discussion with the students on this normal graph. It is available in almost every book of detectors, every chapter of detectors, whichever book you pick up. It talks about, I have this. 
it talks about these four regions the first region which is proportional then the ion chamber this is proportional this is ionization this is proportional here we do not have any detector and then you have Langer-Muller. You have seen this diagram earlier in MSc also. You start with this. The student should be able to draw this diagram on her own or on his own. And after that should be able to draw the schematic diagram. And you will have the PPTs. Don't take photographs. I will give you books also as I said. You will have everything with me. Draw this diagram. Talk about the different regions. Draw the schematic diagram. Write the basic working principle. And in the end, most important is that they should be able to understand this detector is used for which kind of radiation and radiation of which energy. So as you know, if you are talking about x-rays, you have separate detectors for lower energy, you have separate detectors for higher energy. That particular part that there is no global detector for detection. If you want to detect less than 20 keV, you have to think about a different detector. If you talk about a detector who, suppose you want to measure gamma rays, then you have to talk about a detector which is different. That understanding you have to impart and that is sufficient, right? So this is the basic uh, diagram and then the ionization chamber again, you are supposed to show this kind of schematic diagram and then the basic principle, right? which is again based on the same thing as ionization chamber, Both, only that the output is always proportional. Another thing which the, you have to make them understand is that the, what is proportional and why is it important? It is important because suppose an alpha radiation strikes your detector and then it is of 2 MeV, suppose, right? Then your pulse should directly refer to you the idea that it is of 2 Me, MeV alpha that comes. This, this is the basic concept of proportionality. If a 2 MeV or 5 MeV alpha particle strikes a detector, then the pulse that your electronics generates and your data acquisition system generates and shows to you on the computer should make you understand directly that the incident alpha particle was a 5 MeV, right? That's linearity, proportionality. If they are able to understand this part, your work is mostly done. Right? So, construction working, I will share all this with you, this much only. You see, within 2 to 3 slides, if you spend about 20 to 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes per detector or even if you spend about 40 minutes per detector, you are able to tell them these basic things and then you can cover. So, here is construction working, more than that is not required, more than that is not required. Right? And then you come to the Geiger Muller counter, again the description, schematic and how it is able to detect those radiations which are not being detected by either ionization chamber or by a proportional counter. So another thing which you have to, which you will face is that students don't understand why do we need so many detectors, why do we need to have gas detectors separate proportional and Geiger Muller and semiconductor, that part you must discuss for 15 to 20 minutes. That there are different detectors, different radiations, different energies and as per requirement you require different detectors. So I suppose you got the idea of how to cover this particular portion and you see this particular thing is very important, discuss the differences with respect to incident radiation and as well as energy, both of them you must discuss. right? Now scintillation detector is slightly different from this, in the scintillation detector you have first the photomultiplier tube and then you have the PM base and that is why the visible light is used as I asked you just now. Here again schematic diagram, uh, most of the time they are also talking and asking about organic scintillators and inorganic scintillators. Again you need, I am sure all electronic people are very happy to see such diagrams because it is just nothing for them. But nevertheless, these are very simple things. Everybody is aware of that. You are supposed to use this diagram of how organic scintillators and inorganic scintillators are used in scintillators with along with photomultiplier tube for detection of nuclear radiation, right? Let me tell you, these scintillators are not some obscure things only for physicists. Cancer therapy is using it regularly now. I'll show you that. So similarly in organic scintillators all this material is written. So the questions are generally framed on also what are, how are organic scintillators used in organic scintillators, what is the working principle and so on. And then obviously when in Geiger Muller counter you will talk about quenching, what is self quenching and do small numericals on it. Now I am skipping whether the final output of the sensor counter is a voltage or is it in uh, some of where? What? No, 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 all pulses, all pulses, all, now everything is done. So again, solid state detectors you have already, you are already well aware of in solid states, these are most important. Why? Because you use them for x-rays, you use them from gamma rays 
and you use them for charged particles. That is why the semiconductor detector, although it appears to be very simple and very easy for us because it is a very basic thing. Hello, good morning. However, it is very important. It is very important that you make them understand that do not consider the solid state detector simply as some numerical, some some very simple thing that you do in the numeric, in the practical portion. You have to make them understand that the very simple germanium and silicon with its different properties and modifications by the very very developed detector industry right now is being used for detection of low energy X-rays, separately high energy X-rays, low energy gamma rays, high energy gamma rays and if you find them not excited then as I said go to the website of CERN, show them big detectors in which nuclear, in which our Delhi University is collaborating and also India is collaborating, those huge detectors of CBM and of Panda which are installed there with the help of our country's scientists and its uh, staff. So these particular detectors are mostly based on these principles that we are talking about. Generally while, while we are teaching this particular syllabus, the general disconnect with the students is if I am not interested in physics or else, or if I am not interested in physics, how does it affect us? But here in this particular syllabus, you can drive to home the part that is, is it is affecting you irrespective of whether you are going to do with uh, make a career in physics or you are not going to make a career in physics. Further, there are some certain variety of students who are definitely going to go in physics and for them it is extremely exciting to see the detectors in photographic form in the websites of IEC or TIFR or ECC or RRCAT and not and then finally also in CERN where Indian collaboration is there for building up these detectors and they are all based on this simple principle. If you add up this part while teaching this particular portion you will be finding that the students are very much engrossed and they are giving attention to it. As you can see, with, I just uh, told that girl I need a PPT on this and you can see how much that girl has labored and has done it in just half a day. So it's just half a day that she did all this. Okay, and I did not tell her anything. Apart that, I need complete details on all detectors. So the takeaway part is in this whole unit of detectors, we are going to talk about the first graph which demarcates the detectors talk about the energy aspect, the charge particle and the radiation aspect and then use the following detectors with the schematic diagram and basic working principle. Please don't give them dictated notes, ask them to prepare it themselves, this is very important. Otherwise they end up writing very, very sloppy way of you know, expressing something. Of course you have to use these uh, diagrams to show how the semiconductor works. So these are certain photographs, you will find several in your internet. And if you do not want to surf yourself, you can ask me, I can provide them to you. So that was the PPT of Anjali Kanta telling you all about detectors, right? So any questions or any comments or something and so on. Here she has not added the real photographs of many detectors. I will share with you another PPT where you can show them how an X-ray detector is different. What all varieties of X-ray detectors do we have? What all varieties of gamma ray detectors we have? And as I said, this is a very important portion for all the students who go to the fourth year or the third year because this is a mandatory portion in the nuclear portion, physics portion of NAP. So, any questions and so on? I will switch on to the next PPT. Yeah. The also in the, uh, the no. You have to, uh, so the question would be running like this. You can make it very interesting. You see, when we are talking about exercising the brain, it is not only numericals. We, are, we will discuss it towards the end of all, after I finish all units. I will talk about if you are the paper setter, what should you think? How much is to be covered? And if you are teaching the paper, how much you should cover while teaching so that there is enough numerical, there is enough derivation and there is enough inferential thinking. So NEP is talking about higher order thinking skills and this particular paper allows you to develop these higher order thinking skills first, first of all don't ask plain details, why don't you ask differences between the two, the three or four, why don't you just give them a list of radiation with their energy, you type of particle, type of charge particle, type of radiation, their energies and then you say please write down which, which particular detector will detect this particular radiation at this particular energy. So you can use low energy, you can use high energy on alpha particle. If they have understood, they should be able to answer, right? But, but the syllabus says no, it doesn't indicate any derivation and because, uh, I mean you can take my word, you will not be able to do any derivation. You can definitely, when I am sharing the book with you, there you will find small formulae there, are there, that formulae they should know because they have to do numericals on it. The Shom series on modern physics, the Shom series on uh, 
The Chomp series on modern physics and college physics. These are two Chomp series. Towards the end, if you go down to the last chapters, you'll find small numericals on detectors, which can be very nicely done with small formulae which you uh, which are connected with these detectors without derivations. Right? So you can have good questions. You can energize them with the uh, numericals. And um, I can also provide you a list of how many numericals are there in how many books. So generally I share an excel sheet with my student. There are two kinds of excel sheet. One is personal performance and the other is group performance. In the personal performance the student writes down what all has to be done and when she finishes that particular portion that sheet is shared with me. She ticks that yes I have read it, I have understood it, I have made notes of it, I have done numericals on it. So how many and then the group performance sheet has uh, all numerical books listed with numbers listed and then they have to write down I have finished these many numericals and that sheet is globally shared with the entire class so they are able to see that the other person is progressing and you know jealousy is the most important factor to make anybody move further so when they see that the other student has done 10 numericals the next day you will find the other girls have also started doing numericals so there is some 20 books are listed depending upon their capability and let me tell you you will be surprised there are girls who did more than 600 numericals within one semester and I checked it. It was not just that they said they did and I said, okay, fine. I checked it. So, they are, there are capable people and they are our future scientists and teachers. So, we have to be very careful in nurturing them. The ones who are going to proceed with physics. And so, with this, the detector portion, that is one of the uh, portions in our syllabus comes to an end. And now we switch on to the next portion. So, so do you want to, uh, is it, it's 11, 8, we have 20 minutes more? Yeah. So, I'll quickly go to the medical applications, which is interesting. And then, finally, after tea, we talk about doses, the units, and so on, right? Because that's, would you like to have it before tea or it's a bit engrossing? Because it's all, uh, so let's quickly see which we can understand. I am trying to snatch our time for more uh, more of our simulations in the afternoon. So, applications in medical science, uh, look about, uh, about it, I have already spoken yesterday a little bit. And these slides which I am sharing now are made by the girl who didn't do well in theory and she decided to study finally. Right, so, the part of the syllabus, unit number 4, some 3 hours are there for entire application of radiation as a technique. Like applications in medical science, you have to talk about basic principles of x-rays which you have already covered partly in unit 1. You have to talk about MRI, you have to talk about PET, CT scan, projection imaging gamma camera and radiation therapy. This is part of the syllabus. Right? Now uh, the books to be referred are, in Lily you have in great detail all these topics, very nicely written and there is no problem to you one reading and it is, you are able to understand very easily. For the students, you can share slides or make up your uh, notes. Um, another book also I have already mentioned you, this provides you complete information and Wikipedia etc. is also, also there for more images that you can download. So, computed tomography, the CD uses an X-ray tube and an array of detectors arranging the supporting framework to rotate the quotient. Here, when we teach this particular portion, please remind them of all the, all the Bollywood movies where they have seen their uh, characters going into that long table that goes into the CT scan table and tell them that it generally lasts for about 10 to 20 minutes. After 25 minutes, there is no CT scan which runs larger than that. It gives a large amount of sound. What all is the physics that is involved here? There is a lot of magnetism, electricity is there and radiation is there and the CT scan is required in certain cases, just having an x-ray is never sufficient, right? So these parts, if you start with, they get energized because they have definitely heard of CT scan either in their family or so on. So you have a continuously rotated collimated x-ray beam. By this time, because it is the last unit, you have already clarified to them what is x-ray, how much energy it is giving from an x-ray tube and then you can also give values by finding out uh, what CT scan is there in your city or vicinity, how much energy they are using. And the output from the detectors is analyzed by a computer which produces pictures or images. You can, for example, have your own CT scan in somewhere in the family. For example, if I have a CT scan, I generally take it to college and show it to the students. That yes, look, the CT scan exactly looks like this. 
and then they're able to figure out oh yes this is that part of the body and so on so uh, I have a small personal lab of CT scan images of MRI images of x-ray images that I have collected over the years to make them feel you know that yes they are talking about real life and not just plain physics. So CT is used for many types of radiological exams and is particularly useful for diagnosis for malignant tumors. So that is very important and in this CT scan this is a schematic diagram this is a good schematic schematic diagram to make them understand you have the object the x-ray soft and then the detector and then there is there are multiple x-ray sources in certain cases and by this way although the patient or the object is stationary you have radiation crossing over throughout the perimeter so that circle in which you enter is actually sending rays like this along the diameter and ultimately all these detectors around the ring are detecting each detector is detecting in the same way which we have covered so you cannot teach this uh, particular unit in detail without teaching the detectors otherwise everything will be unclear to them. You have to teach how detectors are detecting, how pulses are created, how they are uh, processed through electronics and through computers and then an image is generated. Further here they are generating images. In normal physics experiments in accelerators we are only bothered with pulses or signals as you see in a CRO. But here that is not the case. These images are being constructed and so all, around, all, all over the perimeter you have various detectors and depending upon how much is the power of your CT scan and how much is required for your particular case. So for example, for example, the most tough CT scans are of the head to detect malignant tumors. That part is, so they use maximum detector and maximum power for the head. Yes, yes x-ray is nothing. Compared to a CT scan, it is nothing. Here, if you, um, now I don't have, I, I should have brought it today. I should have brought on a real CT scan for you to, uh, if you, to see that it is how clearly it gives you a clear image of the body. X-ray is like baby, baby information in front of this. Right, so you share the schematic diagram and then they are able to understand and give some photographs of real CT scan uh, which you can easily find on internet, right. So the principle of, and how much are you supposed to teach? You, again, remember you've got only few hours. So you only schematic diagram, the idea, and then you share how it works. If they've understood detectors, they will understand this portion also. So principle of operation shows a CT system in which the source and the detector system are rotated around the patient as he or she is traversed through the system, right? Modern CT equipment is capable of multi-slice. So you, they make slices of your body virtually and according to it. So the doctor on your prescription writes the slice that he wants, right? So that is how they understand that this particular size slice where the, where the possible location of tumor is there. Helical scanning where the patient table and therefore the patient moves through the x-ray fan beam while the tube is rotating. Rather than just a slice or set of slices, a volume of the patient is irradiated. So you cannot say that my tumor is here, so why don't you just irradiate this portion? That's not possible. Why can you do it? To see the 3D side. No, suppose I don't want to see 3D. I know exactly it is here. Okay. If you want to irradiate just this one centimeter of your head, how much amount of radiation will have to be penetrating? How much high energy will it be there? Those people who have cancerous tumors on their brain and are undergoing radiation therapy, they are using gamma nine. I must, I think you must have heard about gamma nine. What is this? The gamma rays enters the brain, okay? And if there is a tumor somewhere, it enters there. It's called a gamma nine because the moment it reaches the tumor, then the intensity is increased and the tumor is burnt completely, and then the gamma beam is retracted. So that means a very high dosage of gamma rays is being entered to kill that tumor there, right? But in this case, you just want to know where the tumor is or you want to know where the, uh, the location of the tumor and its complexity along with the tissue. In that case, you need not be bombarded unnecessarily with too much of radiation. There it is already certified. This is a diagnosis. This is not treatment. So this is a difference that in radiation. The radiation can be used for diagnosis and when your diagnosis is certain, it is used for cure, which is right now being done for cancer therapy. right? You must have heard about how the everybody knows about radiation, normal radiation. But I'll tell you about one another facet which is still not so much established in India but has started in the world to treat cancer patients just by putting them on accelerator tables. So they are the targets, right? 
So the other thing just is nice. So volume, so low dose radiation is giving them the diagnosis. So we will not give high radiation just to find out whether a tumor is there or not. Right? This leads to much faster acquisition of imaging data from a greater section of the patient, but if not controlled properly, may lead to increases in patient effective dose. You see? So you are not supposed to go repeatedly for CT scan. It's better to spend money, go to the best CT scan available in your city rather than go to cheaper and poorer resolution. As a physicist, always ask for resolution. What is the resolution of this device? Right? You can do that surfing at least for yourself and impart this information to students also. So this is a schematic diagram, right? And within about 20, 25 to 30 minutes per topic, you can cover very easily. So just look at it. This is one image, as you can see. X-ray for sample, step-by-step -step rotation. Where is it? This is exactly what we did. There is an area of detector. This is X-ray for me. Step-by-step is being rotated. And it is all controlled. And that's our CG scan. So you have further, uh, just a sec, you have further how whether to do it in a cold beam configuration, planar, fan configuration, depending upon the malignancy of the body or whether they are just trying to find out what's wrong with your body, they use these different configurations. So the student can just look at the schematic diagram, make, make a note that depending upon the disease, different configurations are used and that's enough. More than that is not required in this particular syllabus. Now PET, you already know that PET, uh, positron emission tomography is very, very required. You have this center near in Delhi University nearby, where this is one of the best methods to detect early stages of cancer. Most of the time people think that the, the teachers, uh, the doctors are writing unnecessary prescriptions of these kind of diagnosis, but till date, PET is the only method which can detect cancer at the even when it has not reached its first stage, when it has just started in the body, right? If somebody can have that diagnosis. So positron emission tomography, obviously we know how positrons are created and it is a medical imaging technique used to visualize and measure the activity and function of organs and tissues. So here you can have thinking questions like, when should, I give, have, when should you have a CT scan done? When should you have a PET done? When should you have an MRI done? You know, this, uh, differences between the various devices and when, are, when and why they are required. It relies on the principle of radiation physics and the detection of emitted post positrons. So the student just has to understand how is positron emitted and which detector is detecting it. That's all. And this is doable within half an hour. So positron emission photography, tomo uh, tomography, sorry, and here are more. So that is the kind of, you see, this person has cancerous tissues. And that's the image of a pet. This is another image. These are detector rings. These are scintillator crystals. I told you it's a very important detector, which is used scintillation and photomultiply tube. So if you want to teach this, you have to teach the detector portion first, right? And then only start with this. And so you, we know how the pulse processing we know very well. And you have two detectors. You then give signals. This pulse, this pulse. The both pulses are AND. You use the AND gate, and ultimately. All the images covered by various detectors from various angles are joined together to make images like this. So I think this is something very beautiful how physics is used for the benefit of mankind. More obviously if somebody is interested they can go and uh, read a lot. And other images how this, uh, the patient is kept here and this is where you see there are two this positron and then coincidence you need to process and finally you have this here. So the working principle of PET would be again something like so we generally focus a two, two and a half pages of material over every particular facility, not more. Because more than that neither can they absorb nor can you teach and nor is you know taken along with them. So a small amount of radioactive substance called the radio tracer is injected into the patient's body. The radio tracer is typically a positive strong emitting radio nuclide such as chlorine AD and it is then attached to a biologically active molecule automatically by the body. Then, once inside the body, the radio tracer undergoes radioactive decay, positrons are emitted, and then from the decaying nucleate, positrons are antimatter counterparts of liquids in a short lifespan, and further last, you have positron elevation. When a positron encounters an electron, then they go an elevation process, and then you have gamma rays, and these gamma rays are detected. So it's so simple, just four paragraphs and we understand the technique of how PET takes place and its importance in human life. So coincident detection, all this you all know through pulse processing and electronics. And then all the detectors together will give rise to image. It's the same as CT. 
right next is magnetic resonance imaging you can energize the students by talking to them that mri two tesla three tesla which boards have you seen in your city so they will generally say no ma'am 2.5 tesla and then you uh, automatically generate the question why is mri 3 tesla better than 2.5 tesla what is tesla doing here where is the magnetic field where is it required and so on and then what is the solenoid you know these kind of things they can uh, they can be used to energize them and connect them to daily life very easily so in magnetic resonance imaging again you will use uh, the basic working principle it has it uses a property of stable nuclear rather than potentially hazardous radiation to obtain information about the interior of an object now do you know why MRI, when is mri required i don't ask you <laughs> when would a doctor ask for mri something that you all must know because everybody is sure you are going to grow old na at least i am sure i am going to grow old yes so whenever anything goes wrong with your nerve endings when you have pain in your legs when you have pain in back lower back anything to do with below or abdomen and below pelvic girdle pectoral girdle below so below pectoral girdle anything that goes wrong if there is any ailment in the back you should never hesitate to immediately go for mri if the doctor even hints to you don't delay 17000 rupees who will spend and so on just go for it because it will give you a sure shot answer and i can also share with you that it is one of the wonderful ways you should thank physics and physicists and and on those doctors who uh, discovered this you can find out the beginning of a tumor at a very very early stage and you never know what happens nowadays so you should never i have in my own family we suffered with so much of knowledge just imagine the doctor did not speak about mri and when he spoke about MRI, about mri the tumor had become so malignant that it had to it, it had to lead to a very major surgery you see you can understand what a pain it would have been for me and i was going on why don't you ask for mri why don't you ask for mri no and the doctor is telling me eh, x ray is enough x ray is enough and i'm telling you why don't you go for mri no this is enough this is regular this is normal tumor it will go away we are giving him doctors in aims you know they did not go for mri ultimately i had asked the private doctor please write an mri and the moment the mri was done what was not shown in x ray came out so nicely in mri so you have to thank physics and doctors for this wonderful device and use this knowledge and impart this to the students so this magnetic resonance there is a resonance imaging is done the magnetic field is used and it is enough to again have just few paragraphs over the working principle it's all written here and you will get the ppt so you see you get clear very very clear images right although mri is quite costly not for delhi university permanent teachers if you are referred by a proper doctor and so on and not costly than your life nothing is more costly than your life right so it is a, 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 these are just images just to give you an idea that how clear the tesla is important because it gives you clearer image so if you have a possibility to go for three tesla you should not go for two tesla mri just because it is cheaper right so so same way so you see all these non hazardous it is a recurring process no first of all you see if you really go for only in those cases where malignant tumors have to be monitored whether they are becoming better or not so if you have a malignant tumor and they have given you a medicine or they have performed an exp, uh, uh, an operation and they need to find out that is it really improving then also an mri is not repeated before 3 months 2 months at least but is there any exposure of ionized radiation yes of course everything has radiation in it you are exposed but taking an mri once to save your life and becoming better is much better than dying and not having an mri done <laughs> so you have to <laughs> choose between the two finally this projection imaging gamma camera which you have heard of uh, many ways in uh, cancer treatment gamma camera again has scintillation so you see all these devices are using scintillation where this visible light detection is very important so uh, in scintillation the photomultiplier tube with either organic scintillator or inorganic scintillator is connected together and you have this gamma camera this gamma camera just a sec it also it is also called scintillation camera or anger camera and you are using scintillation i have already spoken to you about it 
This is the schematic diagram which you can use about centimeters. So you see, so here is a patient, here is a patient, and the scintillations are then connected here. These are photometric values and the usual computer electronics that we all know of. So this is an example of optical and back scatter. Just see what is the difference. And this gamma camera has back scattered image possibility also. You can see this patient lying here and this gamma camera. It is not having one detector. Do you see this honeycomb structure? Each one is an individual detector. So, from every smallest aspect of your um, affected portion of your body, it is capturing a pulse. And then all these particular detectors are creating the final image. So, with this portion of uh, um, these apex, MRI, CT, etc., 4 hours are there and it is just sufficient to bring home these points. At least, they also understand they have to keep themselves healthy. And while you speak, you hear your own voice. So you also try to be healthy and not uh, fall into the trap of so many diagnostic problems. So gamma radiation emitted from the radionuclide which is administered, it travels in all directions. A fraction of the radiation travels towards the gamma camera. That an even smaller fraction travel at the correct angle. So why are there so many honeycomb structures? Because we don't know in which direction the gamma is. So you have the gamma in and then it is going out. And then how is it being detected? So you have to have cameras in every angle. God knows in which direction the gamma will travel outside your body. And then it must be uh, uh, captured by the crystal and processed. So when the gamma photon strikes the crystal, a light photon is produced. This light photon is then converted into an electrical signal. And that is why the scintillator is required, which is having the visual light. So amount of light reaching the photomultiplier is proportional to the electrical signal. So proportionality is very important. That is there for all the detectors. So just like in X-ray, the gamma camera will yield a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional object. A tomographic version of the gamma camera is called SPEC, which yields slices throughout the body. So because the detection techniques of gamma cameras and SPECT are based on the same concept, the same radioisotopes can be used for both techniques. So finally, Finally, the ion beam cancer therapy, which has been initiated in GSI Darmstadt, Germany, and is now been replicated all over the world. Even India is starting to think to treat cancer patients. So, what is happening? This person has a malignant tumor, right? And then, uh, the, through the accelerator, we take carbon ions and make it reach to the exact spot. So, when it has reached the exact spot of the tumor, then suddenly the intensity of the carbon ions is increased. What is happening in, uh, in the gamma knife and so on? You are bombarding the entire body with that gamma, right? This is the source. You are putting the patient in front of that source. Entire gamma is traveling over the rest part of the body, even where there is no tumor. Because the gamma source is here and you are here. But what is happening here? It will first reach the tumor and then, because it's an accelerator, you can increase the energy of the ions at any time, at your will, to your level. It is increased to the level which is required to kill the tumor. And then the tumor is killed by that ionized uh, ionization, that is ionization procedure because of the charged particle which is created in an accelerator and then you just make it zero and pull it out. Right, so right now in Germany hundreds of patients are used by making them lie down on accelerator tables, it's called brad P. This is what is what are you going to calculate in your experiment in the afternoon. So you see it reaches there. You can see this red top. Can you see this red top? How I'm using my with, uh, with the laser. So it enters, it is reached, and now when it is reached, it gets his increase. Then when it is killed, it is reached. So. So right now the accelerator is 90% booked by cancer people and only 10% for physicists. So I think it is an amazing thing and if you want just Google. Depthing water equivalent in Depthing water, so this water equivalent part, I, I don't know because I got this slide just to tell you. This is that I, I can find out what they can Maybe it is that. This is a related graph, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And as I say, I just took out this picture just to tell you that this is started in the world. This is not part of our syllabus. But just to see how, how far reaching consequences are, India is going to start now. Cancer therapy, 
at one of the accelerators. Either at IEC or TIFR will depend upon government's decision. What is the chance of? I didn't get you. So uh, they have a whole history if you go to GSR and they, you find out this, just locate this is GSI and this is accelerator. Yeah, here it is. GSI, Darmstadt, Germany. Just go into that section, they have a complete data. So the tumor is not killed in one row. They do not bombard you with infinite radiation in one row. They decide the dosage depending upon the huge research going on. So if their tumor is big, then they are giving doses. Just like you get in doses in AIMS with gamma and so on radiation therapy. Recurrence rate is there in some cases but not in all. So you, they have around 1000 plus patients already treated and recovered and totally free of cancer. I am not an expert on it, but then you can definitely go to the website of GSI and look for cancer and find them. Accuracy level of the penetration is Very accurate. Exact issue. Very accurate. That is why it is so successful. You read exactly the tissue, you monitor everything through computers, through imaging, then you reach the tissue, then you increase the value of the... You can now, now maybe you can have a talk on this sometime on or some of your... Sorry. Everything is all these parameters are completely controlled by accelerator people. You tell them I want a spot of one millimeter by one millimeter. If you have collimators and beam monitors, they can tell you two millimeter by two millimeter, diameter three millimeter, four, five. Medical scientists generally use you know eight, nine millimeters also because they just want to irradiate their samples and they don't want to go into detail. I am an anatomic physicist, I will not settle for a which is more than 3 mm diameter because my target is only 9 mm in 9 mm. The question is, uh, if these beams are affecting the tumor, they also must be affecting other tissues. That is what I am saying, it will not be, I will tell you why. These beams are increase in intensity only after they reach the tumor. To the rest of the body is a very low intensity. That is why they are so, they're so famous. Increase in intensity will be penetrating to the entire body. It can't go there and then increase. It can. This is what is the whole physics about. That is their marvel. It reaches, so they locate the tumor, shortest distance to enter, enter. When it reaches the tumor, increase the dosage. It kills the tumor to some extent. You make it zero there itself and then we will switch off. So this is a complete field just to energize you to that that this has far reaching consequences. It's not part of our syllabus because it is it involves a very rigorous understanding of accelerator and nuclear physics. So I think it's time for tea. As you say. No, as you all say. <laughs> if your ears are closed, what's the use of speaking? And which arms we are So, okay, so that's it. Uh, we speak about that's all. This was definitely the largest. This is a photograph to show you how many types of scintillators and so on are available. Definitely, internet is having hundreds more of photographs. It gives you a feel that what we are talking about, what does it really look like? Right? So, yeah, so I'm over with the present lecture. So, participants, we come to the end of the day six. Day 6 session 1 and it was enlightening to know about ionization, ionizing radiation, origin of radiations, then there are man-made and natural radiations. What are, what are the protective rules? This, this is most important and if we try to convince our students for going to such jobs that yes, they, there cannot be a possibility of zero exposure but yes, the safety is always there like wearing a seat belt when we drive and sit sit on the first seat of course because of that we do not leave driving or riding in a car so protection rules are very important in case even if we are not going for jobs but one of our or some of our relatives or friend circle require any kind of exposures or medical assistance through these kind of detectors so ma'am told about uh, detectors in detail and how do we need to discuss them in the with our class Further going that how uh, different applications in medical uh, science, uh, yeah. applications of radiations using various tomographies and they can be life saving with all precautions. Of course, life is foremost. So 
We thank Professor Punita Verma on the behalf of organizing committee and participants for giving us enlightenment and connecting us to the subject so nicely that many of us would be thinking to float it and start teaching from tomorrow. Thank you so much.